The 15th Chief Albert Lutuli Lecturer has highlighted the importance of African unity to bring about hope for the continent. Nkrumah, that is Kwame Nkrumah, Samia Nkrumah rather, says also through unity, Africa would be in a stronger position to control its economy and deal with security issues. She's chairperson of Ghana's Convention People's Party and daughter of that country's first president, Kwame Nkrumah. She was delivering the Chief Albert Lutuli Memorial Lecture in Durban this weekend. She also added that the only way Africans can have the power to control our resources is to unite, to think, plan and work together. Nkrumah says uh, through African unity, we can at once deal with border disputes, have a coordinated defense system, a bigger voice on international stage, and of course, a stronger currency that uh, will be backed by our uh, combined resources. Samia Yaba Nkrumah is the only daughter of the legendary Osa Gyefo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and his Egyptian wife, Madame Fatia Halim Ritz. And she joins us uh, in the studio. A very uh, good evening to you. Such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, to mm. be in this country. I was yes. just picking up on some of the issues that you were talking there about the issue of African unity. And obviously that was inspired by events here in South Africa. I think we've spoken about those ad nauseum now, the, 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 the self-hate, etc., etc. But I just want to talk about um, your unique circumstances, um, where you were born, where you lived, and how that has influenced your ideals of African, pan-Africanism specifically, and what being an Africanist really is? Yes, certainly. Um, being a product of, you know, a Ghanaian father, an Egyptian mother, that has certainly helped me see Africa as one. Mm -hmm. So you could say I'm a pan-Africanist by birth. Yes. But I think I'm truly a pan-Africanist by conviction. Mm -hmm. um, having studied our father's books, he wrote not less than 10 books. Mm -hmm. And most of his books centered around African unity, the need for Africa to reverse all the consequences of colonialism mm. and, but, but, but you know, I, by I, uniting. And we'll talk about the consequences of colonialism and where we are in post-democratic um, Africa as a continent. But having experienced that your father is asking and the reasons behind them, some of which were questioning what they call as aggressive pan-Africanism and um, what they saw as interfering, wanting to use the Ghanaian army to go fight liberation struggles in other countries. And just what eventually resulted in the fracturing of that unity on an ethnic basis, on a sectorial mm. basis? Okay, no, I don't think it wasn't really like that. You see, we gained our independence, mm. and that was the first step towards full emancipation. Because we knew that, okay, now we have national liberation, but we are not yet economically free, culturally we are not fully emancipated, so we knew we would have to do that. Now, the, our fathers and mothers, in their wisdom, they said independence was the first step. You needed to have the freedom to say these are the good things we must do for our people. But we also realized that most of our states are economically unviable. They are very small and they are not industrialized. So how can we quickly achieve a level of development that will do away with take away poverty, um, literacy, underdevelopment? Now there was a clear path not imposed from outside, but by us. If your father or mother leaves you some guidelines, copious guidelines, plans and books, do you shelve them aside and go to somebody outside and say, how do I manage my economy? How do I manage my, our conditions? No. The first thing you do is to see what the pioneers of independence and unity said. Mm. And if we revisit the, the guidelines, you will see that it made a lot of sense. Mm. They were saying that we need to be politically and economically united so that we can move all in one direction. I've served as an MP, a chairperson of a party, and I can tell you, I've seen that we are restricted by our smallness. 
And I know if we go back to our history and civilization, Africans were never small units mm. isolated. We were big civilizations, the Ghana Empire, the, the Mali Empire, the Songhai and Empire, Samia, I the think this, is, this brings me more to the point that if you look at the configuration of Africa uh, pre-colonialism, it was, um, uh, you know, cut up in that way, so to speak, because of the various empires that existed, whether uh, people took over or entities took over ent uh, control of another or not but it, it, there's some sort of logic to it but there are those who say now if you talk about democracy in modernized Africa you're borrowing it from countries who've gained their sovereignty through the violence of colonialism so how can you really rest on that and try and build something that is quintessentially African including within those knowledge systems that you speak about pan-Africanism and African unity is an African story it's an African response to our current challenges. You see, many of our countries gained independence and we've been struggling like half a century ago. We are trying, we've tried different things. It has not really worked. We know that we have a huge, growing, young population. Mm -hmm. What do we do? Many of our countries, we import too much. What do we do? Now, there's a simpler response. Why don't we pool our resources together, our human and material mm -hmm. resources? That's what some big countries have done. Look at the United States of America, 51 states under federation, united. Now look at Latin America, South America, disunited. You can see the difference in strength and power. So look, look at the big blocks in the world today, China, India. These are big blocks. Why can Africans not have a nation of 1.2, 1 1.5 What is your billion? answer to that? If we, if we trace uh, some of what has happened historically here, uh, again, going back to those who say, uh, I spoke about the violence of colonialism, but I would also like to speak about if you look at what we apply as democracy that, uh, or, or decolonization, that, that has been really a, a, a tool of Western policy makers and their agendas. Is that partly to blame? There are many things. Colonialism is to blame. Imperialism is to blame. That is domination by others. No doubt about it. But the time has come mm. when we can do something. Our elders, they struggled for national liberation. They couldn't complete the full journey towards emancipation. This is our time and this is our mission. What are we doing? What are we going to leave for our children? They did something, but now it's our time. And I think the African today is placed in a very good position to take control of our destiny. Because we've seen different, we've tried to sort things out alone. It hasn't really worked. And many of the good solutions that we've come put forward mm. have lacked, have been piecemeal, what you can say, piecemeal approach to unity. But I am saying, let us go back to see what people like Kwame Krumah said. They said, African states must unite politically. And in, when, once that happens... It, that political common purpose can guide other forms of uh, integration because even a decision like having one common currency, doing away with borders, mm -hmm. it's a political decision. Who is going to make that decision? It's politicians at the end of the day. But we will not arrive there unless you and I and everyone around here has a certain consciousness believing that it is time for us to put pressure on our leaders to go move towards unity. It is time that popular determination now takes control. But, the people, but, the voice of the people must take control in that direction. What would bring about that commonality? Because... Um, if we look at our African borders, uh, looking at the Berlin Conference and how we've been separated, etc., it, it was not on the basis of um, the commonalities, values, principles, yeah, right. uh, uh, cultural practices yeah, right. of our people. So what would bring that 
about. Because if you you're right. were, if you're looking at what when you went back to Ghana in two thousand and eight and you said, I want to rekindle the the vision of Kwame Nkrumah, what was it then and what is it now? Yes, I did so because um, I remembered what was always told to us, to us, seek ye first the political kingdom. You see, decisions are made politically. The answer is always political. The problem, the symptom might be economic, but the solution is political. So the right kind of policies must be put in place. African unity is just one of those policies. Mm -hmm. We need to unite. We need to industrialize in a green way. We need to do different things. But you were saying something important. Yes, the borders were imposed on us. So if something was imposed on you by those who sought to weaken you and dominate you, are you going to hold on tightly to that which was imposed on you to weaken you? It doesn't make sense. So it is time that we start reversing one by one all the consequences. And we've been doing that over the decades. Would that include our electoral systems? So those who say that yes. winner takes all approach is actually anti-African or Africanist True. in its approach <laughs> because ideologically we're borrowing it from what works in Europe and not necessarily in yes, Africa. Yes, and we've been having that debate in Ghana. I mean, you know, even though we've had political stability since 92, um, every eight years there's a change of you know, party, ruling party, peaceful transfer of power. But we've been having this debate about democracy because democracy must deliver better standard of living to the majority of the people. It is true, this kind of democracy we are practicing is not really delivering. And one of the problems is that winner takes all. And if you read about our traditional African belief systems and the way we practice mm -hmm. democracy, you're right. We never left anyone to leave a room discontented. You would sit and talk and, and, and argue and persuade and convince until everybody more or less is okay. So we, we strove to reach consensus as against the winners and the losers, losers, and the winners, the victorious uh, take all, the losers are the vanquished. So you're right. There are things we need to review. Or, but this is part of what Kwame Nkrumah called the African personality, the, the African consciousness. All this is our task. It's the homework of this generation. But consensus should also mean popular consensus because if we're to then say then uh, according to uh, the West uh, if we talk about uh, democracy that's more relying on administ administrative state approach as opposed to what we would in modernized Africa be looking at. So how do we do, you spoke about combined resources at the lecture that ultimately if we did that as an African nation that we'd be able to achieve more. But we also still, and I, I go back to that issue of deconstructing what decolonization is. There must be consensus on, on those things as well, the tenets they are. But I think m most African, you see all the, what are we doing this for or discussing? Why are we talking? Because we want mm. a better standard of living. We don't want poverty. We don't want people without water. We don't want people who cannot, uh, Africans who cannot afford to study, who, you know, who cannot, who, who live. We don't want to see Africans living in shacks. And there are many things we desperately want to change. So most people want a better standard of living and what we are saying is it is possible it is not possible with policies that are borrowed from outside but it's possible if we look inward to the solution and one of the ways of looking inward is to try and maximize optimize our development by working together it is, it is not something that people don't understand. Surely that should mean greater participation, elevation of women and youth. Absolutely. In the I'm structures happy you, you said it. 
Because, because I, I, I mean, it was said it was history that you were uh, the first chairperson of the CPP and, and it was a, a, a major event. Was this, but I thought it was an indictment that we should be sitting here saying, wow, this is the first uh, woman chairperson of a yeah. political party in Ghana. Yes, yes, you are right. Uh, but we have to stand up and stand out and put ourselves forward. We have to create those conditions, you know. Yes, there are always some pioneers here and there, but you are right. Nothing will change until women stand up and be active participants in that change. I think Africa is waiting for women to be fully involved beside mm. the men. That's what happened in our independence struggle. If you chronicle all the stories, you will find that women were deeply involved. Is it easier for you being Kwame Nkrumah's only daughter to uh, stake your claim at the table to say, I yeah. have something to say? Yeah, of course, say. I, c I come from a great, that great um, tradition, yes, indeed. Uh, that great thinker, philosopher, writer, he paved the way for us, you know. So, but we need, so we need to use that, that goodwill. I mean, that leader who was popularly voted in 1999 by, through a BBC survey as the African of the millennium. So he must have done or said something mm. right. So yes, maybe it's easier for me to get up and speak because of that. But then I want to use that goodwill that all African have. To Africans give a hand have. up to other women. Absolutely. And our women are strong. You know, we just, our women are strong, they are capable, they are intelligent, they, we just need what to put some policies in place. What do you see as a major challenge place. they face, especially within uh, uh, Ghanaian politics? Let's start there and then we can look at uh, mm -hmm. vastly in Africa. The, the challenges, are, they are uh, numerous, but let's look at one, the monetization of politics, the mm. fact that it's very expensive to run campaigns and participate in campaigns. And it is a fact that there are, there are less very, very wealthy women or women who have access to money than men. Plus, it is harder for a woman to raise funds without being compromised in one way or another. So the, the heavy involvement or use of money in politics is one of the hindrances no doubt about it and this is something we have to deal with we have to work at because we need people who can deliver not necessarily people who have the capacity to run expensive mm. campaigns there are so many good people who are afraid of getting into politics because they, they are afraid they cannot raise the but money But it's also it. how they get into politics. And this leads me to my next question. Do you think that the youth are handling it better as we've seen the new forms of protest in various African countries that have literally forced government to their knees, that has literally forced political parties to make way to demands of young people? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and young people will speak out, will protest if they feel they are not heard. If we listen to them more, we w there would be no need for these protests. Mm. And I think we must listen to young people because the average African today is a young person. Uh, in my district, about 30 per 68 percent are, are young, below the age of 30. So we, we have to listen to them. I mean, there's no, there's <laughs> we can't run away from mm. that. But listening to them is one thing. But also knowing that we need to provide jobs by producing locally and stop importing blindly so much right. that we can produce. Samia, just a final important. question. Which of your father's philosophies stand out the most or even a saying that you would quote from his writings that still give you hope that Africa can still find a way in which uh, we can stand up proudly and say that we've overcome and achieved uh, these goals that we've set for ourselves, that of democratization, of uh, economic yes. emancipation, equality, representativity, etc. Okay, since we are talking about women, this quote comes to mind, which I've talked about over the last few days, and that's from one of his books he wrote after the illegal overthrow of his government in 68, Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. 
And he says you can measure the degree of a country's revolutionary awareness by the political maturity of its women. Women are the grassroots, so if they are politically mature and involved, change does happen. We've seen it in the past, we can see it again. I love Kwame Nkrumah's um, ideas because they give us strength and confidence. He didn't say Africa can unite, he said Africa must unite. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Sharing your insights, uh, Samia Yaba Nkrumah, the only daughter of the legendary Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who was uh, Ghana's uh, first prime minister and president. We're going to take a break, don't go away.